Hello, I'm going to read a letter that was written exactly 188 years ago today on January 1st, 1836. This is a letter, it's a detailed account of Dade's battle. Uh, it's a report written by Captain Francis Belton, commanding at Fort Brook, to the Adjutant General and the Secretary of War in Washington. Uh, we have a few accounts of Dade's Bow. The most famous is from a soldier who survived named Ransom Clark. The problem is his story is greatly embellished because Ransom Clark went on the speaking tour and made it more exciting for the crowd. Um, Ransom Clark uh, embellished his story, <laughs> said he was in the country for nine months. They spoke the Indian language. None of that is true. So when you're researching, you try to go the furthest back to the early accounts, try to get the most accurate story. Of course, this has some bias like everything else, but it's uh, right after it happened when the stragglers are coming into Fort King. So let's see what it says. Fort Brook. Florida, 1st of January, 1836. Sir, I have the honor to advise you on the 16th of December via Pensacola of the course of events here to date. The schooner motto arrived on the 21st of December from Key West with Brevet Major Dade and his company, 4th Infantry, 39 strong, with a small supply of musket ball cartridges after looking in at several points between the key and this place, being thus reinforced, I hesitated no longer to put Gardner's Company C, 2nd Artillery, and Fraser's Company B, 3rd Artillery, in motion for Fort King, pursuant to General Clinch's orders, which movement had been ordered on the 16th and suspended the same day on account of intelligence I had received of the force of Mikasukis and their strong positions near the fork, forks of the Withlacuchi. So Major Dade, his company comes from Fort King. Basic, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Major Dade comes with his company from Key West. Uh, only 39 soldiers. It basically closes down the military post at Army Post at Key West. And he joins Captain Gardner and Captain Fraser's companies that are already at Fort Brooke, making 110 soldiers. Uh, Captain Belton, afraid that the post is less left vulnerable to attack, orders uh, an officer down to Key West to retrieve some artillery pieces there. I dispatch the public schooner motto on the 23rd with Lieutenant Duncan, 2nd Artillery, to Key West with a battery of two 12-pounders and other stores as may be serviceable. And at 6 o'clock on the 24th, the companies, Gardner's, Frazier's, made 50 bayonets each. So that's two companies of 50 men, uh, 40 men from Dade's command. Uh, so you have, that's 140 men. Why is there only 110 men with Dade's command? That's because some are left behind at Fort Brook. Uh, there was some that may have been sick, or there's a soldier who was court-martialed and stayed behind and didn't die in the attack like everybody else of the command. Fif made 50 bayonets each by details from their companies remaining here and with one of the six, two six-pounders at this post, with four oxen I had ordered to be purchased, one light wagon, and 10 days provisions were put in march. The first halt of this command was at the Will Hillsborough River, seven miles from this post. Uh, Fort Brook, as boundary actually extends out 20 miles, uh, so technically they're still in the post uh, on the 24th. Uh, what it is, if you go to Fort Leonard Wood, there's the main post, and then there's a the big, huge training area that you don't see. That's pretty much what it was like in this situation. 
the bridge which I had reconnoitered by Indians of a Mafalus band the day before. From this herd from Major Day, pressing me to forward the six pounder, by all means it having been left from the failure of the team four miles out. I accordingly ordered the purchase of three horses and harness, and it joined the column at nine that night. On the night of the 24th, I had I heard that the transport of Major Montfort and company, long and anxiously expected, was in the bay. I sent at one o'clock a letter to him, arrived by at daylight by an Indian express urging him on. So Major Montfort was supposed to be uh, accompanying Major Dade with two other companies, which would double the size of Major Dade's command. Uh, but they got delayed and ended up on the wrong side of the bay. Tampa Bay is a pretty big place. So they get stuck and they never do meet up with Dade. He landed with a strong company on the 25th about noon and informed me that Leggett's company under Lieutenant Grayson, nearly full, must be near at hand. Of this, Major Dade was informed by a most gallant volunteer, Jewel C. Company, 2nd Artillery, who had left the detachment with news of the burning of the big Hillsborough Bridge. Uh, Hillsborough River Bridge was burnt. That's where Fort Foster is today. Uh, Private Jewel had left with that word to from Major Dade, Captain Belton, and then Private Jewel returned to Dade's command to meet the same fate as the rest of the company. The burning of the Big Hillsborough Ridge, near which Major Dade had halted the second day, the 25th. I also informed him that I was using every exertion to push on about 1,300 rations on pack horses with what ammunition could be spared. A duplicate of this was sent the next day by a young Indian who had become lame and could not overtake the column and returned with his letters. Jewel joined Major Day at 11 o'clock the night of the 25th. Okay, go down there. In the chain of events, it is proper that I should mention that three Tallahassee Indians came in on the evening of the 22nd of December and made great excitement on Holadia Mathla's camp. They brought a talk of Micanopy of a Micanopy of Pasic or neutral character. What is about 700 Seminoles who are willing to emigrate and friendly with the United States are camped around Fort Brook. Three Miccosukees show up to try to persuade them to fight and stay in Florida. Uh, these chiefs, their lives are also threatened uh, by death. Uh, they're afraid that the chiefs might suffer the same fate as Char Charlie Amathala a month before. Let's go to the next page. Uh, brought a talk of a basic or neutral character as they affected it. I be, believe not distinctly until after I had made them prisoner while in full council with the Mathalas warriors, which step I considered imperative if they were spies and as much so if they were charged with any propositions likely to detach the chiefs from the treaty or indeed by an act of self-deviation to take the scalps of a Mathala, Black Dirt, and Big Warrior faithful chiefs who have been hunted in this way since the scalping of Charlie Amathla. Pilati Amathla and Fukulusti Hajo, or Black Dirt, they are the main Seminole chiefs. Uh, they leave and go to Indian Territory, what's now Oklahoma. So, you know, they're not as famous or as well-known as the other chiefs like Micanopi or Alligator. Um, and uh, Pilati Amathala, he dies just a few short miles to Fort Gibson, never makes it out there. And so this is going back in time because it says in a council with Amathala that night, Major Dade expressed every confidence in Indian character and particularly upon the salutary 
of the imprisoned Tallahassees as hostages and sent the youngest and best runner with letters to General Clinch and to General Thompson via Micanopy, as I could do no better, of course, through Abraham's hands. So to get the letters to General Clinch and Wiley Thompson, they also have to appease Micanopy and Abraham who are between there. This letter, it does not go in a uh, kind of a linear timeline. It kind of goes back and forth. So it may get a little confusing if you don't know the events behind it. These letters, of course, involve many details, but numbers and other facts to guard against treachery were stated in French. The runner returned two days beyond this time with a message from Abraham and Broken Sticks stating my talk was good and that I might expect him on the 30th. Of course, that would be after Major Dade was dead. This we freely rendered that he would be at the attack fixed for Christmas week. A Negro, his intimate, named Harry, controls the Pea Creek Warrior Band of about 100 warriors, 40 miles southeast of us. Uh, so he's talking about a band of Black Seminoles under uh, command of a Harry on Peace Creek. 40 miles southeast of us who have done most of the mischief and keep this post constantly observed and communicate with the Miccosukees and at with Lacucci by means of a powerful band of Eufaula alifiers under Little Cloud and Alligator. So they keep in communications with Little Cloud and Alligator's bands. In tracing Major Dade's movements, I have every reason to believe that he made the 26 miles, 27th to Big with Lacucci, and on the sixth day, 28th to the battleground. So he's saying he crossed the Big with Lacucci on the 27th and made to the battleground 28th. Uh, the night before the battle, Major Dade camped at a pond about four miles short of the battle that we call the breakfast pond. That's now a uh, private ownership. Here it may be proper to state that Major Montfort's command was ready to move early on the 26th, but the transport in which was a company second artillery, Lieutenant Grayson, unfortunately entered the wrong bay and got into shoal water and was not seen or certainly heard of until the morning of the 28th of December, when by sending a party with a flag as a signal, Lieutenant G was put in possession of instructions and landed his company at a point four miles west of us on the east side of Tampa Bay proper and joined at sunset that evening. His transport but did not get round and land his baggage till the 30th so long an interval as to put all hope of a junction out of the question, and Major Montfort's baggage was unloaded. So they didn't get fully landed and unloaded until the 30th, two days after Major Dade had been killed. Now it becomes, now it becomes my melancholy duty to proceed to the catastrophe of this fated band, an elite of every patriotism, military skill, and constant courage. On the 29th in the afternoon, a man of my company, John Thomas, arrived temporarily transferred to com C Company, 2nd Artillery, came in and yesterday ran some Clark with four wounds, very severe, and stated that action took place on the 28th, about 10 o'clock, in which every officer fell and nearly every man. So the battle happened and they're getting word as early as the 29th that they got wiped out. So, um, and I know it's 60 miles from where the battle was, but if, uh, if you get attacked like that, John Thomas, he's pretty motivated to get back to the fort and just not stop. So he's going, uh, walk or run as quick as he can. 
the command entrenched every night and about four miles from there, halt, were attacked, received at least 15 rounds before an Indian was seen. Major Dana and his horse were killed on the first onset. The interpreter Lewis, that's Lewis Pacheco. Lieutenant Mudge, third artillery, received his mortal wound, the first fire. Um, uh, Lewis Pacheco, the black interpreter, he actually survives and was captured by the Indians. And uh, Lieutenant Mudge, third artillery, received his mortal wound, the first fire, and afterwards received several other wounds. Lieutenant Bassinger, second artillery, was not wounded till after the second attack. And at the latter part, he was wounded several times before he was tomahawked. Uh, for those not familiar with the battle, there's actually two parts of the battle, the first attack and the second attack. The first attack is when they're ambushed and fired upon. The uh, soldiers you know, are surprised. Uh, they fix bayonets and charge off the Indians. And the Indians stand back for a while. The soldiers build a crude breastwork, fell trees and logs. The Indians are watching from a distance and finally come in for the second attack and wipe them out. Captain Gardner, second artillery, was not wounded until the second attack. And at, at the last part of it, Lieutenant Bassinger, after Captain Gardner was killed, remarked, I am the only officer left, and boys, we will do the best we can. Lieutenant Keyes, third artillery, had both arms broken the first shot and was unable to act. and was tomahawked the latter part of the second attack by a Negro. Lieutenant Henderson had his left arm broken the first fire, and after that, with a musket, fired at least 30 or 40 shots. That's pretty good to have one of your arms broken and still fire a musket 40, 40 times. Uh, Dr. Gatlin was not killed until after the second attack, nor was he wounded. He placed himself behind the breastwork, and with two double-barreled shotguns, said he had four barrels for him. Captain Frazier fell early in the action with the advance guard. As a man of his company, B, 3rd Artillery, who came in the morning, uh, wounded, reports. Uh, this third uh, soldier, survivor, is not named, but it's probably Joseph Sprague, which was the third soldier who survived and came in on the attack they were in a column of route and after receiving a heavy fire from unseen enemy they rose up in such a swarm that the ground covered as was through by light infantry extension showed the indians between the files muskets were clubbed knives and bayonets used and parties clinched in the second attack, our own men's muskets from the dead and wounded were used against them. A crossfire cut down succession of artillery at the piece. 49 rounds were fired. The gun carriage was burnt and the guns sunk into the pond. A war dance was held on the ground. Well, you know, not sure if that hap happened there or not, but the cannon had with it 50 rounds to fire. 49 had been fired the 50th round was in the cannon ready to shoot uh, at the time the match went out and the remaining soldiers had been killed at that point so the battle ended with the last round of the cannon in the barrel many negroes were in the field no scalps were taken by the indians but the negroes with hellish cruelty pierced the throats of all whose loud cries and groans showed the power of life to be yet strong. The survivors were perceived by imitating death, except Thomas, who was partly stripped and brought his life for six dollars, and in his enemy recognized an Indian whose axe he had helved a few days before at the post. So Private John Thomas survives by the Indian watching over him, uh, 
Thompson basically bribes him, gives him six dollars that he had in his pocket. The Indian recognizes Thomas as having fixed his axe at the uh, post Fort Brooke a few days before the battle. About 100 Indians were well mounted, naked, and painted. The last man came in, brought a note from Captain Fraser addressed to Major Montford, which was fastened in a cleft stick and stuck in a creek, dated as supposed the 27th, stating that they are beset every night pushing on. With regards to the affairs at this post, I have to state that the schooner motto, though daily expected, has not yet arrived. The defenses have been somewhat extended and strengthened. The old cantonment has been entirely abandoned, and we are anxiously await ordnance and ordnance stores. So they're afraid at Fort Brooke that they may be under attack, so they abandon some of the old breastworks and structures and are concentrated in the newer portions of the post. The garrison is healthy. I've caused to embark on board of the return transport to New Orleans. Several families made widows and orphans on the fatal battle of with Lacucci. So a uh, little point, point here is that Dade's battle at first is called the Battle of the with Lacucci. Uh, this will soon be changed shortly after as there will be another battle of the with Lacucci three days later on, de later on December 31st. Uh, in fa fact, there'll be five or six battles on the with Lacucci. So it's renamed Dade's battle. These are recommended to the kindness of the commanding officer and render the disbursement to be covered by the quartermaster department. The vessels engaged for the immigrating Indians to rendezvous here on the 15th instance have in part arrived in a schooner from New Orleans with, with provisions making in fault five. So five ships have arrived. We have had no communication with the Florida headquarters on any subject connected with the public service for near four weeks. On this day, the distribution of provisions under the treaty commences under an existing order. So the Indians around Fort Brooke are due rations and provisions by the treaty. Uh, Indian agent is dead at this point. He's just been killed. So uh, those duties, uh, Captain Belton takes on his command to issue those rations. I have so co far considered myself an Indian agent as to authorize the issue and to take measures for the security of provisions by distributing them in the transport now anchored in the bay. This arrangement I cannot report as completed, but hope to succeed without additional expense. So the uh, rations are still on the ship and he's issuing from there rather than bring them on shore because he doesn't feel they'll be safe on shore. To land these provisions at the post when already so much public property is immediately exposed to conflagration in the event of an attack and not protected by a successful defense of the place would ensure its destruction and perhaps crush all hopes of immigrating. The proceeding will, I trust, be improved by the Secretary of War. In conclusion, I beg leave to remark that such are the Indian combination that is not considered practicable to force or keep open communication with Fort King with less than a well-appointed and instructed force of a thousand men. Uh, that will soon arrive. Three out of four bridges are destroyed. Two fords are very difficult, and the country may generally be described as a series of ambuscade and defiles. To the adjutant general, U.S. Army Washington, I have, et cetera, et cetera, uh, F.S. Belton, 2nd Artillery Commanding. So that is the end of the letter by Captain Francis Belton of Dade's battle and the situation they're under. Uh, you might find it interesting reading the actual letter on the anniversary. We have Dade's battle reenactment this weekend, January 6th and 7th. And as in, as in the account, 
of course, you'll have the Indians and soldiers fighting, but the Indians will not be naked as they were in the description in the letter. So you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> and uh, hope to see you there. Uh, come to Dade Battlefield this weekend. Thank you.